Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by and welcome to the Pure Storage Second Quarter Fiscal Year 2022 Earnings Release Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. At the conclusion of our prepared remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If anyone should require assistance during the conference, please press the star zero on your touchtone pad at any time. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. I want I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference call, Mr. Sanjay Karana. Mr. Karana, please go ahead. Thank you and good afternoon. Welcome to the Pure Storage Second Quarter Fiscal 2022 Earnings Conference Call. My name is Sanjot Karana, Vice President of Investor Relations at Pure Storage. Joining me today are our CEO, Charlie Giancarlo, our CFO, Kevin Chrysler, and our CTO, Rob Lee. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that during this call, management will make some forward-looking statements which are subject to various risks and uncertainties. These include statements regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and related disruptions, a growth in sales prospects, competitive industry and technology trends, our strategy and its advantages, our current and future product offerings, and our business and operations. Any forward-looking statements that we make are based on facts and assumptions as of today, and we undertake no obligation to update them. Our actual results may differ materially from the results forecasted, and reported results should not be considered as an indication of future performance. A discussion of some of the risks and uncertainties related to our business is contained in our filings with the SEC, and we refer you to these public filings. During this call, we will discuss non-GAAP measures in talking about the company's performance and reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP measures are provided in our earnings press release and slides. Additionally, when we refer to sales in our prepared remarks, we mean total bookings excluding cancelable orders. This call is being webcast live on the Pure Storage Investor Relations website and is being recorded for playback purposes. An archive of the webcast will be available on the IR website and is a property of Pure Storage. With that, I'll turn the call over to our CEO, Charlie Giancarlo. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Pure had an outstanding Q2. As a growing, share-taking company, we expect every quarter to be record-breaking, but this quarter was extraordinary. Sales, revenue, and profitability were well above expectations. Revenue growth this quarter exceeded 23%, and we had the highest Q2 operating profit in our history. I was especially pleased with the growth of both our new and existing products, the balance of performance geographically, and our continuing penetration of cloud and large enterprise. These are all key parts of our long-term strategy that we've shared over the past several years. These results also show that our strategy of investing into the pandemic and specifically investing in our enterprise sales capability and expanding our product line was the right one. As we discussed in past calls, we predicted that Pure's growth would accelerate as businesses adjusted to the COVID environment. We believe that our growth will be even stronger as businesses return to an in-office environment. We estimated that this would start this past Q2 and we are obviously very pleased with the results. Looking ahead, we expect that businesses will continue to, to adjust to the effects of the, of the pandemic while driving digital transformation. We believe that the Delta variant has slowed a return to the office environment only temporarily, and that large-scale global vaccinations will do much to enable a full return to normal by spring of next year. As we indicated last quarter, we believe that the current environment enables us to return to our historical double-digit growth rates with increasing profitability. Our leadership and innovation of the data storage and management market continues to grow. Our strategy is focused on delivering a unified cloud operating and procurement model across all data storage use cases and environments, enabling modern cloud native applications built on containers, and driving the modernization of today's infrastructure with a focus on the all-flash future that modern applications will demand. Let's take a quick look at the results. This past quarter provided many areas of outstanding performance, highlighted by the highest total sales 
for any second quarter in the history of the company, growing more than 30% year over year. Continued strength and momentum in subscription services revenue, up 31% year over year, with strong growth in pure as a service, which almost doubled revenues compared to the prior year. And our success in large enterprise continues to grow, comprising over 50% of our sales, with our top 10 customers spending more than $100 million in total. As I mentioned, both our new and existing products achieve new sales milestones. Frankly, the superlatives from this quarter are too numerous to fully enumerate. But here are a few hi highlights. Growth of our subscription businesses were very strong this past quarter, with sales of both Pure as a Service and Portworks approximately tripling year over year. All subscription sales taken together, including Portworks, Pure as a Service, and Evergreen, increased almost 50% year over year in Q2 and is approaching one half of Pure's total sales. These results show both the continued attractiveness of our Evergreen model and the market's excitement for our new subscription offerings. It has been nearly a year since we announced the acquisition of Portworks. Every quarter as part of Pure, Portworks has beaten their targets. This past quarter, Portworks sales tripled year over year and continued to gain many new customers, both large and small. Financial services and service providers are particularly interested in the ability to easily scale container-based workflows with Portworks. Flasher AC continues to deliver tremendous growth, with sales tripling over last year. It remains the fastest growing new product in Pure's history and is enabling customers to transition to an all-Flash data center. Cloud customers in particular are making use of Flasher AC to improve their reliability, to reduce their environmental footprint, and to lower their operational costs. For instance, a recent eight-figure win with a top 10 hyperscaler, which will begin to ship this Q3, was won against traditional magnetic disk based on our high performance, small space and power footprint, and superior total cost of ownership. Safe mode is another compelling reason why ever more customers are turning to Pure. This high performance ransomware protection solution for both Flash Array, Array and Flash Blade takes less than a millisecond to create an immutable copy of data for fast recovery. And customers can send these snapshots to a variety of destinations, such as Flash or AC, FlashBlade, or AWS, Microsoft Azure, and NFS shares. Only six months after introduction, over 500 customers have enabled safe mode. These examples demonstrate the success of our strategy to provide organizations with the modern data services they need to modernize their data infrastructure, to take advantage of modern applications, and to manage their data and infrastructure through code in a multi-cloud environment. Our focus on these goals has been rewarded with new and expanding customer relationships. For example, one of our enterprise customers, a global Fortune 500 financial services firm, recently chose a pure as a service subscription to fuel the expansion of their core operating applications in a virtual hub. While increasing the performance, flexibility, and scale of this global platform, they were able to reduce their physical footprint by nearly 80%, contributing significantly to their environmental sustainability goals. They estimate that this will reduce their total cost of ownership by nearly 70% while providing significant performance increases. And with growing global concerns about ransomware attacks, a UK-based securities firm with sub-millisecond performance requirements found performance, simplicity, and safety in Pure's recovery capabilities. Using Flash Array Safe Mode with our Flash Blade Flash Recover solution on an Evergreen Gold subscription, they now have the data protection and unified fast file and object platform they need to scale safely. Our strategy since our founding is to focus on doing the right things for our customers and on doing things right. Our environmental goals dovetail with our customer first values. Part of ensuring that our products and services have the lowest total cost of ownership 
means designing products that use less energy, require less cooling, need less maintenance, take up less space, and produce less waste. With our customers' increasing focus on their own environmental footprint, we will be providing more quantitative measures and sustainability programs going forward. Pure storage is advantaged by the major trends in our industry. We enable companies around the world to shift to a cloud operating model for their private and hybrid cloud infrastructure. We lead in driving the all-flash data center, and we have the most advanced services and tools to automate data management for our modern cloud-native applications. As we entered the year, we stated that our customers would accelerate their investment in digital transformation with renewed confidence in economic recovery this year. This was clearly evident in our performance in the first half, and especially this past Q2. In the current environment, we are confident that the momentum of our first half will continue into Q3, as evidenced by our Q3 guide and raised annual outlook. I want to thank our employees and our partners who have worked tirelessly to support our customers with great products and great service throughout the uncertainty of COVID-19 and who have created our sustainable momentum. Everyone at Pure deserves to feel proud of the advancements we have made through this difficult period. One last note that I would like to add before I turn the call over to our CFO, Kevin Chrysler. I am very pleased to announce that Rob Lee, who many of you know, has just been promoted and will serve as Pure's Chief Technology Officer. Congratulations, Rob. John Cogrove, a.k.a. Cos, who in addition to his title as founder also served as CTO, will now take the title of Chief Visionary Officer. Rob will continue to report to him, and Cos will continue to serve Pure full-time. Congratulations, Rob and Cos. Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Charlie, and good afternoon. We could not be more pleased with the strength of our business, our execution, and Q2 financial results. We saw strong sales execution across the globe, which is reflected in our sales growth of 32%, excluding countable orders. Similar to what we saw last quarter, our entire portfolio, including our subscription services, contributed to our performance. Our core business of Flash Array X gained significant strength across our enterprise, commercial, and public sector customers. Flash Array C sales more than tripled year over year, and Flash Blade sales established a new record high for Q2. Our revenue growth was 23% this quarter, and product revenue had its highest year over year growth rate compared to the previous seven quarters. Remaining performance obligations, or RPO, which includes our committed and non cancelable future revenue, was $1.2 billion, growing 25%. RPO growth reflects the continued strength of our subscription services, including record sales this quarter of our unified subscription, Pure as a Service. We acquired 380 new customers, representing 10% year-over-year growth, and we saw particular strength with new enterprise customers this quarter. Now turning to specific financial results for the quarter. Total revenue grew 23% to approximately $497 million. Revenue in the United States grew 25%, and international revenue grew 18% compared to last year. Subscription services revenue grew approximately 31% year over year and represents approximately 35% of total revenue. Product revenue was very strong during the quarter, growing 19%. The differentiated value of our software and solutions continue to be reflected in our non-GAAP total gross margins of 70.5% this quarter. Non-GAAP product gross margins continue to be on the high end of our long-term expectations at 70.3%. We expect that product margins will fluctuate depending on product mix as our newer offerings continue to scale. Non-GAAP subscription services margins were 70.7%. Revenue and gross margin outperformance and improving sales efficiency contributed to delivering strong non-GAAP operating profits of $46.6 million, continued reduced travel due to the ongoing COVID environment, 
and slower than planned hiring also contributed to lower operating expenses during the quarter. We ended the quarter with over $1.29 billion in cash and approximately 3,900 employees. Cash flow from operations achieved a record high this quarter of $123 million, resulting from improved linearity and strong collections, as well as increasing operating leverage. Capital expenditures were $28 million during the quarter. We returned approximately $44 million of capital to repurchase slightly over 2.3 million shares as part of our 200 million share repurchase program. Now turning to guidance. We are very pleased with our sustained momentum and improving operational efficiencies. We expect Q3 revenue to be approximately 530 million, growing almost 30%. Our revenue guide for Q3 includes revenue we expect to recognize in connection with the sale of Flash Array C to one of the top 10 hyperscalers. We also expect non-GAAP operating profit will be approximately $40 million. I have mentioned in previous quarters that we would not be updating our annual view. However, given the strong performance of our business over the last several quarters, including our strong financial outlook for Q3, we have also updated our annual view. We now expect that revenue for the year will surpass $2 billion, growing approximately 21% to $2.04 billion. We also expect that operating income will be approximately $150 million. This is an exciting time at Pure. Our strategy, innovation, and service is compelling for our customers, and we are executing with a focus on accelerating revenue growth and increasing profitability. Thank you to all of our employees and partners. I'm also really looking forward to having you join us at our virtual Analyst Day on September 28th. With that, I will turn it over to the operator so we can get to your questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. In the interest of time, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question. Once your questions have been answered, please jump back in the question and answer queue. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. And your first question comes from the line of Pinch Lemon with J.P. Morgan. Oh. Great. Hey, uh, uh, thank you guys uh, and good afternoon. Uh, congrats on the quarter. Seems like a super solid uh, quarter here. Um, probably one of the highest beats, I think, if I was just looking at it uh, going backward. Um, Charlie, maybe at a high level, uh, did anything surprise you in the quarter when we were doing checks? A lot of partners kind of highlighted that Pure continues to be, uh, continues to see relatively short lead times while competitors kind of struggle with elongated lead times. Do you think that is helping you to gain share? Anything that surprised you uh, in the quarter we're looking at? Yeah, thanks, Pendulum. I, I think the reason why we're, we're, we continue to gain share and why the quarter was so good is that, you know, we've been preparing a, uh, a portfolio of products that are really second to none. Uh, and while, you know, that was being done during the beginning of the uh, COVID crisis, of course, there's a lot of disruption, you know, in our customer base. But as the customers have become accustomed to operating within the COVID environment, you know, that portfolio and our um, – focus on developing, uh, you know, a, a set of enterprise capabilities, both in sales support as well as uh, with our products, you know, it's finally all uh, coming together and hitting stride. And so, no, we, we expect this to be the beginning, if you will, of a, uh, of a very evident growth uh, for the company as we go forward. Wow. Um, strong comments. Uh, thank you for that. One follow-up uh, uh, for Kevin, it seems like you were able to maintain the, the gross margin sequentially, if I, if I did my math correctly, quickly, uh, despite the inflationary pressures that have been creeping up. Is it fair to say that you saw kind of a better pricing environment, maybe, as the component price inflation presumably made the competitors do less discounting in the field? Well, hey, Pinchelman, I, I, you know, one is, is I think the, your math is right. So, yeah, absolutely, we, we held on, on gross margins. And I really think that's a, a testament to a couple things. I, I think the, 
Uh, our operations team continues to do an outstanding job. Uh, our suppliers uh, are continuing to work very closely with us. And yeah, to hold, you know, to answer your question specifically, uh, discounting did uh, hold, and I, I really attribute a lot of that to our sales team uh, and the discipline and execution uh, in terms of why we saw the uh, gross margin performance that we saw. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Aaron Rakers of Wells Fargo. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Also, uh, uh, congrats on the solid results and guide. Um, Throughout today's call, you, you referenced the fact that you've now got a, hyper, a top 10 hyperscale customer. It sounds like for the Flash Array C uh, product. I guess the question on that is that is that, a, is that tied to their cloud offerings or is that for internal uh, usage? And, and do you expect this to kind of be the beginning of more uh, potential hyperscale customer traction for the company going forward? And I have a follow-up. Yeah, it, it's a part of their, uh, of their overall operations. Uh, so I think the answer is affirmative from, uh, uh, from the, the question that you asked. And, uh, you know, we do feel that this is sustainable, both in the sense of, you know, continuing with this customer as well as we think it's the beginning of, of seeing, you know, other similarly uh, situated, uh, you know, hyperscale customers starting to look at, at Flash as, an, as a real alternative. As you may know, most of the hyperscalers, the vast majority of what they store, they store on disk. Uh, they may have a little bit of flash in their servers, but for the most part, all storage is on disk. And we think uh, we think this is the beginning of of breaking that uh, uh, breaking that structure. Uh, we finally have the kind of price performance that can really compete uh, with in the disk market. Yeah, no, very helpful. Um, I wanted to, the the follow up questions on actually the subscription revenue. You you referenced the subscription revenue up thirty one percent, and then I think you mentioned that on a combined basis, Pure as a Service, Portworks, and I believe Evergreen was up close to fifty percent year over year. If I if I correctly got that, so I guess I, I'm curious of what is other you know what is in that other you know subscription services line that that maybe wasn't wasn't growing as fast as as the three combined that you mentioned. Hey, Aaron, this, this is Kevin. This is just a clarification. I think the 50% reference is really towards sales. Bookings, yeah. And bookings. Uh, okay. And, so, and then obviously the revenue, and there's a lag with the revenue. So two, two different uh, uh, metrics here that we're referring to. Okay. So just to be clear, Evergreen, Portworks, and Pure as a Service basically are, are the majority, if not all, of the, the services line in the P&L. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Sydney Ho with Deutsche Bank. Hi, um, this is Jeff Randon for Sydney. I um, just wanted to kind of follow up on the flash race C into the hyperscalers. Um, can you give us an idea of how close the pricing has gotten compared to HGDs, or is this more about the need for better performance by the cloud providers? Yeah, this is Rob. I'll jump in uh, and take that one first. Yeah, so, you know, when we look at flash race C relative to the hybrid and disk systems it's competing with, um, you know, generally speaking, you know, we're seeing uh, flash rate C being very price competitive uh, and actually price advantageous, uh, up to, you know, 30% uh, uh, price advantage in, in some cases. Um, you know, but I think uh, what we're seeing, especially with this uh, large hyperscaler deal, is that uh, price is one element of the equation, uh, but all of the other attributes and benefits we're able to bring uh, from flash, uh, such as uh, the performance, such as uh, power, cooling savings, uh, footprint savings, um, those are all very meaningful across the board, uh, but at the hyperscale, um, you know, they, they become super, super meaningful, right? And, and so, you know, as we look at, for example, this customer, um, you know, Flash Race C was the only product uh, that could meet their needs uh, without them having to go build new data centers. Great. Thank you. And then just as my follow-up, um, you didn't mention anything on supply chain in your prepared re remarks. Can you give us an update on that and if you're missing out on any revenue due to supply chain constraints? Yeah, no. I, I, again, I, I think we're doing a, a great job with our operations team in partnership with our suppliers. O obviously, the environment uh, from our perspective hasn't changed uh, much from what we saw last quarter. Uh, you know, we just continue to, to be focused on it. And, and obviously, you, you see the results uh, in our print. And so this will be an area that we'll continue to focus on through second half. Uh, we'll manage that. Uh, but again, uh, you know, a testament to our sales team to, to continue selling the value, uh, especially the software value associated with our solution. 
Your next question comes from the line of Wamsi Mohan of Bank of America. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, your, your guidance for, for next quarter calls for close to 30% growth, uh, but all that can be explained from sort of that acceleration from 23 to 30 can be explained uh, really through easier compares. Uh, on the one hand, you're seeing, you know, very good traction. Charlie, you spoke about share gains. Uh, you, you essentially uh, are, you know, reiterating sort of this um, you know, better outlook for the full year as well. Uh, just trying to reconcile, why, why wouldn't you see a further organic acceleration on top? I'm not saying 30% is really good, but why aren't we seeing a further acceleration, especially when you think about uh, the comments around the backdrop of Delta being maybe uh, somewhat transitory? Yeah, well, I'm not sure I, I would follow your math in terms of 30% uh, being entirely explained by, um, you know, the, uh, the easier compare uh, last year. It does represent a significant growth rate, not just over last year, but frankly, over the, if we take and, and as a company, we are looking at not just at, at year over year growth rates, but year over two year growth rates because of obviously the anomalous uh, 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 compares w uh, with last year. And it's a substantial gain even over a two year uh, compare rate. So, you know, we think it's a, uh, a suitably um, uh, appropriate guide for this coming quarter. Uh, given given the entire uh, given the entire environment, and it is of course a raise, you know, both from you know our our, uh, our annual look uh, look uh, look forward as well as to you know what was consensus. So we, we do feel that that it's an appropriate uh, uh, raise. Yeah, we're we're very pleased oh. with with what we're seeing uh, in terms of the Q3 outlook and, and the idea that uh, you know we're driving you know almost 30 percent growth next year. Uh, with the opportunity we highlighted on on Slasher AC, so you know I, I think the uh, the guide that we've uh, come out with with Q3 is actually quite strong. So we're very pleased with that. Okay, great. And and if I could, uh, I think I heard you, Kevin, maybe say that um, some of the operating margin improvement, the operating profit dollar improvement, was uh, a function of not able able to hire as fast as, as maybe you would have liked to. Can can you just elaborate a little bit on that? How, how how much behind are you versus target in terms of hiring? How should we think about the trajectory of that for the next few quarters? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, you know what I really uh, was pleased with with the quarter was not only the top line growth that we're driving, but the operating leverage uh, that's coming with it. And and really that's coming uh, you know really from the sales organization. Uh, we're seeing really strong uh, productivity and sales efficiency and discipline, and, and then we're seeing that come through uh, primarily uh, on the operating leverage that, that we saw for Q2 and, frankly, uh, the increased outlook for the remainder of, of the year. And so when I think about the increasing operating leverage, I, I would uh, look at first what we're doing in terms of uh, outperforming on, on sales as well as uh, the gross margin performance execution uh, of the sales team. And then, you know, yeah, yeah, we've got a little bit of tailwind uh, from the COVID environment. You know, as I look at Q2, I would uh, kind of view that between one to two points uh, of, the, of the nine points uh, that we saw uh, this quarter. So not a, not a uh, significant uh, tailwind, uh, but there is a bit of a tailwind that we saw for, for Q2. And, uh, yeah, we're managing that quite well. Uh, obviously, with uh, on the sales side, even though we're we're uh, you know got some more hiring to do on the sales side, they are just uh, doing such a great job in terms of productivity. Participation rates uh, are tremendous. We're seeing a, a great growth in participation rates, both on uh, individual contributors as well as uh, first line managers. So I like what we see there. Your next question comes to the line of Steve Enders of KeyBank. Hi, this is George. I'm for Steve. Uh, thanks for taking the question and, and reiterate my congrats on the quarter. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you could give us an update on uh, your ability to close new logos. And in the past, you've mentioned how COVID is a bit of a constraint from that, but then we've seen things sort of open up and then the Delta variant coming back. So just an update on, on where you stand from that perspective. Thank you. Yeah, we, we do feel that, um, you know, uh, people working at home, uh, offices uh, not really being open is a bit of a constraint on uh, new net new logo growth. Uh, you know, uh, despite that, of course, we, we were pleased with the 10% growth we saw year over year. But in past years, of course, we, we saw more. So 
as uh, we we believe that as uh, things open up more, obviously that's been delayed a bit because of the Delta variant. But as things open up more uh, late this year, early next, uh, we expect that to actually just improve our our net new logo gains. Um, but you know, in the meantime, you know, our continuation to penetrate deeper and deeper into existing accounts, uh, to penetrate deeper and deeper into um, the enterprise. Uh, and I w might point out as well that our net new logo gains in enterprise was actually quite a bit, uh, quite uh, strong. So as you might imagine, the commercial logo gains swamp, you know, because uh, there are so many more commercial accounts. In terms of net new logos, uh, net new logos tend to be dominated by commercial. But actually our gain of enterprise net new logos this past quarter was actually quite healthy. Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Quick follow-up. Um, obviously, you had some nice uh, bottom line outperformance this quarter. Can you give us an update on how you're thinking about uh, driving growth versus operating leverage over the long term? Thank you. Yeah, we, we feel like at this point in time, uh, given our product portfolio and given the, uh, the uh, productivity that we're seeing from the sales force, we're going to be able to deliver both. Uh, we're going to be able to deliver both uh, uh, continued double-digit growth uh, as well as continued improvement uh, quarter by quarter uh, in our operating profit, uh, profit margin. So. Um, yeah, no, we're quite confident in that. Your next question comes to the line of Simon Leopold of Raymond James. Thank you for taking the question. Uh, I first wanted to, to sort of check on, on how you're thinking about the longer-term growth trajectory, because in the past, Char Charlie, you've mentioned growth exceeding 20 percent, and now you put up 23, you're guiding for 29, um, which maybe there's some easy comp to it, but if you could just sort of update us on, on how you feel about the, the overall trajectory relative to your prior comments about exceeding 20%. Yeah, no, I, uh, we've uh, made that uh, commentary in the past because we feel quite comfortable that we will be exceeding 20% for the foreseeable future. Uh, I think we're going to stick to, to that point right now, which is exceeding 20%. Uh, I do think that we have room to grow beyond that again uh, as COVID wanes, uh, but you know, predicting that right now is probably not uh, a fool's errand uh, for for all of us. Uh, but we do feel comfortable that in this type of COVID environment, uh, that we can continue to grow at, at over 20 percent. And Simon, we'll provide and, some more color on that uh, as well in our virtual analyst days. So we look forward in terms of our longer-term growth rates. So look forward to having those conversations as well. Great. And then just, just as a follow-up, you, you were helpful in terms of talking about um, bucketing revenue recurring, but maybe another way to segment your, your contributions is if you could talk a little bit about what portion of revenue and what's the trajectory for revenue that you would consider off-premise. So what you're doing with hybrid cloud and things like the cloud block storage with, with Azure, what you're doing with AWS, could you help us get a better assessment of, of how that fits into the model? Yeah, uh, very much so. So, uh, first of all, we've stated in the past that, you know, cloud revenue uh, has been about 30% uh, plus. Uh, you know, we haven't really uh, calculated it for this, uh, for this quarter to be talking about, but it's trending generally, generally the same. Um, you know, of course, uh, cloud is an area that we're very focused on, and uh, it's an area that, uh, uh, that, we, that we hope can actually continue to increase for us, especially as, uh, especially as more and more customers and workloads go to either SaaS environments, cloud environments, and as the consumer cloud continues to scale. And we feel, you know, as you're seeing with the Flasher AC, that uh, over time, we, uh, because of our belief in the all-Flash data center, uh, the, the last bastion of mostly uh, disk data center right now is actually in the cloud. Uh, and so it's, it represents a great opportunity for us. Your next question comes from the line of Shannon Cross of Cross Research. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of questions. The first, um, you know, strength in cash flow, uh, free cash flow. Obviously, you're buying back stock. Curious how you're thinking about acquisitions and other uses. You know, you're about a year off from when you announced Portworks. None of a follow-up. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shannon. We, we continue to be um, uh, investigating uh, opportunities for, uh, for M&A. Uh, you know, we, we believe that uh, uh, M&A that really um, enhances our ability to provide 
uh, a cloud operating model for our customers is the right way for us to be uh, to be focused. Uh, and you know, there isn't a, uh, a quarter or even a week that goes by where we're not investigating, you know, a potential uh, combination uh, for the company. So uh, M and A continues to be you know an active uh, area of investigation for us. And let me just uh, I, I do want to comment on the, the strong operating cash flows, which which I think were, were tremendous for the company. And again, I, I think there are kind of three areas that I would attribute that to this quarter. Uh, one uh, was really the, the great linearity that the uh, sales team drove uh, this quarter, uh, which really improved uh, collection efforts. And we saw that come through uh, with the record uh, operating cash flows that we saw this quarter. Uh, and the other thing, obviously, is, is the continued focus as a company we have on, on operating leverage, and we're seeing some, some good benefits from that as well. Okay, thanks. And then I'm just curious, given the inflationary environment, um, are you, how are you thinking about component costs longer term and, and also just, you know, some of the increased headcount, et cetera, costs that you're, you're seeing? Um, you know, I, I know you're managing things well and, and pr the pricing environment remains fairly, uh, I don't know, positive. But, you know, how are you thinking about this given what we're at least seeing coming from, from an inflationary perspective? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Let me start, Kevin. You might have uh, more. I would really separate it into the two items that you mentioned. One is component costs, which we have seen an increase, you know, on average about probably about 10% this year uh, in increased uh, component costs. But, of course, we live in a, uh, on a longer-term deflationary environment on component costs. So we really view that as a temporary phenomenon having to do with, uh, with supply chain shortages. Uh, you know, and that should come back, uh, you know, in the next year or so uh, to where to the standard long-term uh, price reduction curve that exists in that environment. On the flip side, uh, absolutely, uh, there is going to be, and there, we're already starting to see the signs of an inflationary environment around wages. Um, you know, our, uh, our forecasts and guides take that into account, but certainly, uh, certainly that you, what, what you speak of is, is becoming evident. Yeah, and one other thing I would just make sure to highlight, too, uh, back to the component costs is, you know, look, our, our approach to sourcing raw NAND uh, really continues to, to be an advantage for us, uh, really, when we look at some of uh, other folks who are, are leveraging sourced SSDs and uh, leveraging uh, our software capabilities uh, to enable NAND management is, is really beneficial for us in this time as well. So I think that's an important call out. Your next question comes from the line of Carl Ackerman with Cowan and Company. Yes, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, with Portworks tripling revenue year over year, is it now accretive to operating income? Uh, and then second, you are exiting the fiscal year in the low double-digit EBIT range. Uh, that's in line with record quarterly results exiting 2019. Um, that's certainly really good. Um, the, the question is, you know, while some skeptics may suggest that's the, maybe the best you could do, could you discuss the operational improvement since the beginning of 2020 uh, that would argue operating profit improvement is sustainable and, and, and able to grow? Thank you. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for the question, Carl. That's been on people's minds. Uh, you know, focusing on operational improvement, productivity enhancement across the board at the company has been something we've been very focused on you know, over the last several years. Uh, COVID obviously set us back a bit uh, because uh, obviously we plan to grow into productivity. Uh, and with COVID, we decided to continue to invest, you know, in areas that were, we felt very important to our long-term growth. In particular, uh, investing in our ability to penetrate a large enterprise, which, by the way, is part of productivity improvement. Uh, and uh, two was to invest in uh, you know, a broad-scale portfolio of products, again, to help us to be able to penetrate and achieve much greater wallet share uh, in, um, in our customer base. Uh, you know, it was only a few years ago where, where we could only address maybe 10% of their storage needs, and, and today it's much wider than that. So, you know, as we look forward over the next uh, several quarters as, uh, with the anticipation for the, uh, the, for the top-line change that we've already discussed, you know, we, we know quite strongly what our productivity gains are going to be in the different parts of our organization. Uh, and these are productivity gains that we're going to be able to, to uh, continue to maintain inside the company. Again, last year was the anomaly, uh, as, a, as it was for many companies, but in different ways. 
you know, for us, it meant that our continued investment, uh, that we wouldn't see the productivity of, or, or the sales return on that until the economy started to improve. And now we're starting to see that. Yeah, let me, let me just add on to that a little bit, if, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, look, I, I think we've made, uh, you know, none of this is a surprise for us in terms of the increasing operating leverage uh, we're driving for the, you know, all due to the points that Charlie's making. And you actually see the great strides uh, go to markets making in terms of uh, their costs and expenses as a percentage of revenue. I think that's going to continue. Uh, I think we'll see over time we'll, we'll get some benefits on, on R&D as well. And, and obviously on our, our gross margins continue uh, to sh be strong. We've seen that on the product gross margin side and, and also believe we can get more scale and improvement uh, on uh, subscription gross margins over time as our unified subscription and pure as a service uh, scales. So uh, I absolutely believe uh, there's uh, upward trajectory uh, to our operating range. Thank you. Your next question comes to the line of Rod Hall of Goldman Sachs. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I guess I wanted to start, Charlie, uh, with this flash array C uh, sale to the hyperscaler. I'm, I'm really intrigued by that as an opportunity, and I wonder if um, maybe you could give us any more color on what that use case looks like, and are there other hyperscalers in your pipeline with very similar use cases? Just, you know, how big is that opportunity for you, and what does that pipeline look like with those types of customers, and then I've got to follow up. Yeah. So, so first of all, the, uh, the individual opportunity itself is a very large opportunity. Uh, it's not a one-off. It'll, it'll, it's something that, that will continue uh, as we go forward, as we understand it. Um, it is a uh, – you can think of it as a general purpose um, uh, uh, implementation uh, for one of their key um, application environments um, inside the organization, but I really can't go much, much further than that. But it's not something that is, to, is uh, unusual or extraordinary uh, in a hyperscale environment. So it is something that's easily transferable uh, to other hyperscalers. It's not the, by the way, it's not the first of the top ten hyperscalers that we've sold uh, you know, this uh, Flash or AC into. Um, it's, just, it's just one that is uh, you know, uh, significant for, for a single quarter. Uh, and we do believe that uh, this is something that we can continue to expand to other hyperscalers as well. Yeah, and just to be clear, too, you know, in terms of the strength we're seeing in our uh, Q3 guide, you know, look, when, when we exclude this great opportunity uh, that we're seeing with Flash Ray C and a top 10 hyperscaler, we're still in our comfortable 20% uh, plus 20% year-over-year growth rate, uh, excluding that opportunity. So I think that's important to note as well in terms of the strength is, is across the business and is across the portfolio. Uh, we're really excited about the Flash Array C opportunity, but it's uh, really incremental to the strength we're seeing. Okay, great. That's that's helpful. Thanks for that. And then I was I was also interested in this comment you made on wage inflation, and I, you know, I guess it's tough to know kind of how that might play out over the next 18, 24 months. So I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts on what sort of inflation um, we'd be talking about. Are we talking about a few percentage points you think you might incur or um, – you know, any I kind of thoughts on quantification of that? I don't, that? Want, to go, I don't want to go over uh, – I don't want to overestimate, you know, what it might be. But our, our thinking is it's going to be a few percentage points, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. appreciate it. Your next question comes to the line of Amit Darinani with Evercore. Yep, um, thanks, and – Thanks for taking my question, I guess. Uh, I have two. Uh, first one, you know, I, I, wanted, I was looking at the subscription growth metrics of 31%, which is obviously fairly impressive, and I think investors tend to struggle with that number a bit. Uh, so I'm wondering, is there a way to think about how much of this growth is coming from existing customers versus new customers? And then could you also quantify the size of some of the components that are within the subscription line? Yeah, we're not going to get into a whole lot of detail on that. Now, obviously, on, on virtual uh, financial analyst day, we'll, we'll provide some color uh, that hopefully you'll find helpful in terms of our, our subscription uh, momentum. But look, it, nothing's changed significantly. We've, we've got great momentum on our unified subscription with Pure as a Service uh, that we've highlighted. Uh, port works, uh, you know, still very important from us from a strategic uh, perspective, but the performance is excellent. And obviously our, our Evergreen is our bread and butter. Uh, it's our baseline, uh, largest piece, continues to be so. 
uh, for the uh, you know for in, in terms of what we're looking at for this year. So we'll get some more details on that as we uh, we look out uh, to the analyst day. But uh, that would be all for now. Fair enough. Uh, and then if I could just follow up, if I look at the growth guide that you're providing for October quarter and the full year, I mean, the implication obviously is October will be up 29, 30 percent year over year. Uh, you've touched on that a bit. But then I think your implication for Jan quarter is it's going to decelerate to like 19, 20 percent. I mean, that's still a really good number, but I would love to understand why the deceleration. Are you seeing a bit of a pull in or are you just being conservative at the implied Jan quarter numbers? That would be helpful. Well, and I think it's important that, the, you know, we've been talking about the uh, large uh, hyperscaler uh, with a top 10 hyperscaler on the flash array C that's, uh, you know, putting some more strength uh, on our uh, Q3 guide. But look, sequentially, it's, uh, you know, even sequentially Q3 to Q4, I'm, I'm pleased with what we're seeing year over year, uh, close to 20% uh, for the, the annual outlook, uh, you know, exceeding 20%. So overall, uh, you know, quite pleased with it. Don't really view it as a D cell, especially when I think about our, our larger opportunity that we're we're digesting uh, or expect to digest in Q3 uh, with the flash array C opportunity. And your next question comes to the line of Kathy Huberty with Morgan Stanley. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Just to come back to the third quarter contribution from the hyperscaler account, was that was a co revenue contribution from that customer baked into the original? Full year revenue outlook, and are you expecting any contribution from that customer that would be material in the fourth quarter? Uh, that's a great question. You know, look at you know when we when we're looking at the uh, annual guide uh, at the beginning. No, it's fair to say that we wouldn't have contemplated. So it's part of our our beat, uh, both from uh, an annual perspective and how we're looking uh, at it for Q3. Uh, and we're not expecting a significant amount to, to come through in, in Q4. We, we would expect a larger piece in, in Q3. Okay. Thank you. And then just a follow-up maybe for Charlie. If we step away from the slower hiring in, in 2Q, which I assume is more a function of the tight labor market, how are you thinking about hiring in the coming quarters to support the stronger demand you're seeing and the intention to sustain growth rates north of 20% for the foreseeable future? It's a great question, Katie. Uh, obviously, we want to uh, sustain um, the strength uh, uh, and, our, uh, and momentum of our sales capability. So, you know, a high degree of focus on sales teams, uh, both uh, U.S. and internationally. Uh, you know, and then continuing to uh, develop, uh, further develop our infrastructure to be able to support sales. So I would say largely, uh, you know, uh, the areas of, of IT, uh, other areas to support uh, sales growth. But the, the, large, the, the largest focus is going to be on sustaining sales momentum. Okay, great. Thank you. Congrats on the quarter. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Nahal Choksi with Northland Capital. Uh, thank you. And, uh, Congrats on a really strong breed and some beat and the 7% above consensus guide for Q3 and the implied guide for Q4. That's awesome. Thanks, Congratulations. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so just to be clear, this top 10 hyperscaler revenue contribution for Q3, very clear now what, what it's going to – how much should it contribute, though, during uh, Q2, though? Uh, we wouldn't have an impact for Q2 now. No impact for Q2. Okay, great. Um, and then you said that PAS doubled in revenue year over year, but what about PAS bookings? Um, oh, uh, so PAS bookings almost, almost tripled. Almost tripled. tripled. Year over year, yep. Wow, okay. That's uh, very impressive then. Uh, and then finally, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then finally, um, you haven't uh, had your long-term model listed in your presentation for a couple of quarters now. Uh, presumably that's because you're looking to update the upcoming investor day. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Cabral with Credit Suisse. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to dig a little bit more into Cloud Block Store. I think it's uh, – Five coming up in six months since you guys went GA on Azure. Just curious what the ramp's been there so far, and just if there's any way to compare or contrast what the ramp on Azure's looked like compared to what you saw in AWS the first time around. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, as we've uh, said in the past, Cloud Block Store a uh, fundamental part of our overall pure as a service subscription. And no doubt uh, it was very critical in driving uh, part of that growth of the pure as a service. Uh, as you know, many customers may, uh, already determine uh, uh, which of the hyperscalers they want to use, and uh, it's been instrumental in several of our pure as a service deals. Uh, some with some very large, you know, uh, certainly Fortune 50 uh, companies that had set their sights on on Azure. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, very strong. And then uh, with respect to uh, actual deployment on Cloud Blocks, we're actually I'm going to let uh, Rob uh, take that because he's the one that's been most uh, uh, tied into it. Yeah. So um, you know, on, on the deployments, you know, Azure's come on really strong, right? So we've seen, um, you know, we see customers now uh, deploying across AWS and Azure. I would say demand uh, for Azure, uh, you know, it, it tends to be a little bit stronger. Um, you know, but if we step back from it, you know, I, I think we look at Cloud Block Store uh, and Portworx as a combination, um, you know, really as, as uh, forming the backbone of, uh, you know, our, our, our cloud portfolio. And we're seeing strength uh, across the board there, uh, really both from customers that are deploying in cloud uh, day one uh, with, with both Portworx and, and Cloud Blocks are now available on multiple cloud providers. Uh, but as well, customers that are starting uh, with peers of service through the unified subscription uh, on premise, uh, and then later on uh, growing and, and um, uh, transitioning uh, into Azure or AWS uh, in time. And so we see uh, both of those motions, uh, and I think that just validates, uh, you know, our strategy as well as uh, you know our thesis that customers continue to value uh, the flexibility and, and uniformity that we're able to deliver across the prem, uh, hybrid, uh, cloud, and, and uh, multi-cloud environments. I will say, uh, just to uh, finalize uh, our thoughts on, on Cloud Block Store, that it is a fundamental part of the unified subscription. We rarely see, although we do see, some customers that will just go to Cloud Block Store without having arrays on-prem, but far more customers are using it as a way for them to be able to transition from on-prem uh, into the cloud, uh, and therefore the, it starts off as a unified subscription and then they start to migrate, whether it's for disaster recovery or other capabilities, dev test, uh, into the cloud environment using Cloud Block Store. So it tends to be, uh, a, uh, first of all, an attractive element to the unified subscription, but secondly, taking advantage of subsequent uh, to the engagement on, on, the, on uh, pure as a service. Got it. All, all that's really helpful. And then uh, just a quick follow-up. You, you called out enterprise momentum several times in the, the prepared remarks and a couple times in the Q&A, but just wanted to expand a little bit more on just biggest contributors or drivers to that strength. And I, I'm curious if there's any way to think about how much of that momentum is just bigger footprint within existing customers versus, you know, get, getting into some net new wins versus the competitive landscape and maybe those being a little bit bigger than they were in the past. Yeah, it's actually all of the above. Uh, first of all, having a, a broader portfolio uh, gets you more respect within, within an enterprise customer, whether that's a new customer or an existing customer. Uh, you know, we had, uh, we had enterprise customers uh, four years ago when I first joined, and their first r r response to me is, uh, Pure, you're great, but we can only use you, you know, for, you know, this, uh, for this specialized environment. Why can't you build products that cover the rest of our uh, uh, rest of our storage footprint? And so, having a broad portfolio is necessary to be a good partner to an enterprise customer. It also allows you to compete for larger deals uh, inside those customers. And then, for uh, uh, a number of customers, and this was certainly true with, with a lot of banking customers, until we could reach a certain scale and address a certain percentage of their uh, footprint, they actually didn't even want to talk to us. Uh, because they want to have, you know, sig what are very significant relationships. So really, um, so I then going back to the beginning of your question, it's been because of the investment that we've made into enterprise capabilities, both sales as well as support. Uh, it's been investment in the, bre uh, the broadening of the uh, product line, uh, and it's been about uh, maturing our own organization in terms of how to work uh, with enterprise customers. So all of those have contributed to our uh, ability to, and our success that we've seen in expanding our enterprise business. And just to add on to that, you know, I think one of the areas uh, we haven't talked too much about today, uh, you know, in the portfolio is Flash Blade, and I think that's a great example of uh, where we've invested in broadening the portfolio, broadening our enterprise capabilities uh, and, and uh, feature sets, 
uh, you know, and that's reflective in, in the strength we saw. Um, you know, Flashblade uh, did extremely well in terms of uh, large deals, and, um, and and just getting back to Charlie's point, having the breadth uh, of, of enterprise capabilities in, in the portfolio, whether it's FlashRay C, which we've talked quite a bit about, uh, FlashRay X or FlashBlade, uh, you know, having all of that together really just helps us go and prosecute these opportunities. And your last question comes in line of Matt Sheeran with Stiefel. Yes, uh, thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, Charlie, in your opening remarks, you, you talked about seeing somewhat of a slowdown uh, in return to, to office uh, on-prem uh, at customers, and certainly we've heard that from other companies as well. Yet your guidance for the quarter is strong, uh, even without that hyperscale or, uh, deal. So could you give us more color on what you're hearing from customers and partners about timing of projects and, and your visibility? Is it better or, or, you know, perhaps weaker because of that? So I think our visibility into uh, their build-outs has been excellent. It really has. Uh, so they share, very, uh, they share openly with us. Obviously, planning of build-outs uh, takes some time, so they do want to share openly. I would say that the return to, uh, we've been – Remember, there was only about a couple of months when there was uh, people returning to the office, and then it got slowed down right away. So most of, most of the improvement we're seeing is from the improvement of working in a COVID environment, not because things freed up tremendously uh, over the summer. So, you know, our guide just, as I would mentioned uh, before, just reflects the way the world is as, uh, as we see it today, not based on any further opening up. Um, we do think that when, when the world does open up, we'll see even better uh, even better performance, to be clear. I, I would say that, if anything, uh, on a very small basis, what we did see was some um, projects move out, but not because of COVID. It was all in, uh, because of uh, customers' uh, ability to get other products for their build-out, uh, you know, with servers, networking, sheet metals, power supplies, whatever it might be. You know, we definitely, we definitely saw, um, uh, you know, expected timelines push out a bit, on, on, in some customer environments. So, you know, but all that, I think, bodes well for us in the future as things improve. Okay, thank you. And, and you talked a lot about the strength you're seeing um, from the enterprise um, customer base. Uh, yet last quarter, you called out commercial as finally picking up. Uh, is that uh, continuing to hold up, or are you seeing any other signs there? You know, it, it, did, it did hold up, but it didn't improve any more than it did last time. So that's what we're waiting for. You know, as, as COVID improves, we think commercial will pick up even more. But, you know, it did hold up uh, certainly through this last quarter, and we expect it to hold up through this quarter. Yeah, I, I think the commercial business did, did really well. I mean, obviously coming off such a fantastic quarter, last quarter, and then, then holding on to that strength I think is pretty impressive. So we were impressed with both enterprise and commercial. And this concludes the question and answer session. At this time, I'll turn the call back over to Charlie Giancarlo for closing remarks. Thank you, operator. Well, Q2 has really been a fantastic quarter for Pure, as our strategy and our execution have become evident uh, this quarter. You know, Pure is being chosen because we deliver a leading and highly differentiated technology with also best-in-class customer experience. It's a very exciting time at Pure, and we're in a great innovation cycle with our portfolio and our sales uh, momentum and our execution has never been stronger. I do want to recognize again the hard work of all of our employees at Pure and the strong collaboration that we've had from our business partners. Everyone's singularly focused on delivering strong results for our customers. Thank you all and have a good evening. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. <laughs>